Greetings from the Nanovic Institute for European Studies here at the University of Notre Dame. My name is Clement Setmark and I serve as director of this institute. It has been established to build bridges between Europe and our university. Welcome to our virtual panel on the Russia-Ukraine crisis. The situation is, as we all know, worrisome with new developments every day. Just looking at the BBC website this morning, we can read, I quote, Mr. Biden said there would be enormous consequences for the world if Russia made a move on a nation which sits on its southwestern border. His comments came as other Western leaders repeated warnings that Russia would pay a heavy price for invasion. Russia has accused the US and others of escalating tensions over their issue and denies planning to enter Ukraine. However, Moscow has deployed an estimated 100,000 soldiers near the border. The Kremlin has said it sees the Western military alliance NATO as a security threat and it's demanding legal guarantees that it will not add new members further east, including neighboring Ukraine. But the US has said the issue at stake is Russian aggression, not NATO expansion. Fears of invasion have prompted Western embassies in Kiev to withdraw some personnel. Diplomats from Russia, Ukraine, Germany, and France will gather in Paris on Wednesday for talks about the ongoing tensions. End of quote. This is where we seem to be in this situation. The Nanovic Institute offers the format of flash panels to discuss and reflect our current developments and events. We've decided to organize a flash panel on the Russia-Ukraine crisis. We offer this flash panel on January 26. As some of you know, Pope Francis, in his weekly Angelus address on Sunday, has called for January 26 to be a day of prayer for peace in Ukraine. The Pope said, I am following with concern the increase of tensions that threaten to inflict a new blow to the peace in Ukraine and call into question the security of the European continent with wider repercussions. It is no secret that the Nanovic Institute has a special relationship with Ukraine, especially the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. In 2019, our president, Father Jenkins, presented the Notre Dame Award to Ukrainian Catholic Archbishop Boris Kuciak for his work for religious and academic freedom and for his courageous and visionary leadership of the first Catholic university established in the territory of the former Soviet Union. It seems appropriate that one of our panelists is a senior leader of the Ukrainian Catholic University. Taras Dobko is senior vice rector of UKU since 2008, after having served as vice rector for academic affairs for five years. He's a trained philosopher, but does hold a diploma in theoretical mechanics. Very impressive. Taras is with us here at the Nanovic Institute this semester as a visiting scholar, and we are grateful for his presence. Taras will comment on the Russia-Ukraine crisis from his from his experience as a citizen, a university leader, a philosopher, and a Catholic. Thank you, Clemens. Welcome, Taraj. Thank you. The second panelist will be Mary Ellen O'Connell. Mary Ellen is the Robert and Marion Short Professor of Law and Research Professor of International Dispute Resolution at the Krog Institute for International Peace Studies here in Notre Dame. Her focus is on general international law, international legal theory, international dispute resolution, and the international law on the use of force. She's the author or editor of numerous books and articles, including most relevant to this topic, The Crisis in Ukraine, 2014. Professor O'Connell was a Marshall Scholar and holds a BA in History from Northwestern, an MSc from LSE, an LLB and PhD from Cambridge, and a JD from Columbia. Mary Ellen will reflect on the situation from a legal perspective. Welcome, Mary Ellen, and thank you so much for joining us. Our third panelist is Michael Desch. Michael Desch is Pecky LD, Professor of Political Science and Brian and Chanel Brady, Family Director of the Notre Dame International Security Center. That's quite something. He served two terms as Chair of the Department of Political Science and survived this successfully. He received his BA with honors in Political Science from Marquette University and his MA in International Relations and PhD in Political Science from the University of Chicago. He has worked in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research in the Department of State in the Foreign Affairs and National Defense Division of the Congressional Research Service. Mike will offer security studies and political science perspective. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining us and welcome. Each panelist, that's the plan, will offer her or his insights for eight to 10 minutes, and then we will have time for questions and comments. We will end on time after one hour since we want to respect your busy schedules. So again, welcome all, and please, Taraj, if I could give the floor to you, thank you so much. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Clemens. Uh, hello to, to the panelists, uh, to everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to contribute to our panel. As we observe the situation in the Ukrainian border, we seem to be on the brink of the war, of the new war in Eastern Europe. A military buildup of Russian troops may develop either into a full-scale invasion of Ukraine or local targeted operations in the attempt to destabilize the country and induce panic in the population. Fortunately, of course, uh, there is much anxiety now in uh, Ukraine, in Kyiv, in our cities, but no panic yet. In any case, we are facing a major crisis which could affect the global security situation for next decades. In my opinion, there are two main objectives that President Putin pursues in escalating the situation. First, instead of playing chess, he wants to play Chapayev's game on the global chess board. Putin wants to overturn the chess board, the international order established in 1991. Second, Putin wants sovereign Ukraine to collapse and become part of the Russian world. So he perceives independent and democratic Ukraine as a threat to his authoritarian regime and his dreams about restoring the imperial greatness of Russia. Let's take a cl closer look at these observations. No doubt, Russia is a world power, greedy and uncontented power. Putin is not satisfied with the way the world is run. So the Donbass is not a target. Even Ukraine is not a final target. The target for Russia is an existing security order. Putin is not trying to improve relations. He tries to fracture NATO and weaken the European security system. So there is no guarantee that Putin's Russia stops on Ukraine. As soon as you start to address one of Putin's demands, be sure there will, there will be another one. The situation reminds me about a famous tale, The Fisherman and the Fish by Alexander Pushkin. One day, an old man is lucky to pull out a golden fish from the sea, who promises to fulfill any wish in return of her life and freedom. His wife sends him to ask the fish first for a new trough, then a new house and a palace, then to make her into a noble lady, then to rule the province, then to become the Tsaritsa, and finally the ruler of the sea so that the golden fish serves her will. The end of the tale is telling. When the golden fish hears the last wish, she brings everything back to the way it was before, including the broken trough. Putin's Russia looks for its own enlargement. Where the West is retreating, Russia wants to expand. Ukraine is not a beginning, but the continuation of Putin's hybrid war and expansion. James Scher, a senior fellow at the International Center for Defense and Security in Tallinn makes it clear, I quote, the problem in the West is the belief that Putin, just like the rest of us, wants peace in the world. But Putin doesn't mind being the adversary of the United States, as long as Russian national interests are being respected, end of quote. Let's now turn to Ukraine. There are four reasons behind Putin's thinking about Ukraine. First, Putin believes Ukrainians to be an integral part of the Russian people with no right for their own political identity. Second, Putin believes that Ukraine is a house of cards, an artificial, fake, and failed state created to make Russia less great. Third, Putin fears democracy in Ukraine. And fourth, Putin strives for the symbolic restoration of the Soviet Union in the new imperial Russia. Recently, in a pseudo-historical piece, Putin has argued that Ukrainians are culturally, ethnically, spiritually, and linguistically tied to Russians. And this accounts for political unity between two countries. Timothy Snyder made a superb analysis of that piece of political demagogy and how it is rooted in the insecurity of the Russian people about its modern national identity. In this regard, I would also like to quote the 20th century political thinker, Vyacheslav Lipinski, a Ukrainian of Polish origin, who once said, I quote, that the basic difference between Ukraine and Russia is not the language, nor the tribe, nor the face, but a different political system which had evolved over the centuries, a different method of organizing the ruling elite, a different relationship between the upper and lower classes, between the state and society, between those who rule 
and those who are ruled, end of quote. Putin escalates not for security reasons, as if NATO military presence on the Ukraine's territory would be a real threat to Russia. It is a liberal democracy and efficient state in Ukraine that are reasons for Putin's aggression. Ukraine's fault is that it is not Russia. Unlike Russia, Ukraine is a democracy, however immature. It distributes its political power and free political competition. Uh, you, you don't know the result of it in advance. It doesn't turn the state and its leaders into sacred objects of devotion. It enjoys free media and helps people to exercise freedom of conscience. Ukraine already had six presidents during its 30 years of independence. We often in Ukraine describe last 30 years of independence as a pilgrimage to freedom and dignity. It was a way of more than 40 million people becoming free. The Maidan of 2013-14 was called the revolution of dignity. It is widely believed in my country that only with this revolution, Ukraine became truly independent. Because Ukrainians dismantled the post-Soviet status quo and embarked on the far-reaching social changes seeking to institutionalize the rule of law, transparency and accountability of the government, social justice, new ethos of public service, anti-corruption policies, and many other things. It was an attempt at a transition from the revolution of dignity to a country of dignity. No surprise that all of this was perceived by Putin as unacceptable. So the seizure of Crimea and occupation of the Donbass followed. And Ukrainians once again had to learn that freedom is not free as it is written on the Korean War Veterans Memorial in Washington, DC. Putin doesn't want the post-Soviet states to enter into any institutional agreements with the civilized world. He wants to keep these states in limbo. For instance, in 2010, the former president Yanukovych took the NATO issue off the table by adopting the legislation about Ukraine's neutrality. The issue of the EU association agreement remained on the agenda. But in 2013, when it came to real action of Ukraine's formalizing the agreement with the EU, it became a problem for Putin's Russia, and he wanted to stop it by all means. The problem is that Putin's logic about Ukraine is either all or nothing. That's why it's, it is so difficult to find a satisfactory solution to the present crisis. Some people believe that certain reasonable concessions should be made to appease and contain Russia's security interests. Some involve, for instance, the case of Finland during the Cold War, where the country managed to find a balance between its dependence on the Soviet Union in the external affairs and broad autonomy in internal affairs and democratic development. But why we think that the Finland-like approach would appease Putin and make him stop preparing a war against Ukraine? In 1994, Ukraine disarmed its nuclear arsenal in exchange for promises that its territorial integrity and security would be guaranteed by the West and by Russia. For more than 20 years, Ukraine was a non-allied country, but it didn't prevent Putin from the annexation and occupation of the Ukrainian territories in 2014. And it was the Russia's invasion that pushed Ukrainian public opinion towards NATO. What I want to say is that we have already experimented with the Finnish scenario and it failed. Moreover, it will not satisfy Putin who doesn't want to give up on interference into Ukraine's internal affairs. This approach would only serve him as a leverage for delayed intervention. In my opinion, security in Europe is possible when both Ukraine and Russia become one day part of the European Union and even NATO. Mikhailo Drahomanov, Ukrainian political thinker of the 19th century, imagined Ukraine as part of a future European Federation and referred to Europe as a space where Ukraine and Russia can solve their problems according to the logic of win-win rather than zero-sum game. Of course, this is impossible with Putin's Russia, but to refuse the NATO perspective to Ukraine will only inflame imperial ambitions of Putin rather than lead to a peaceful Europe. I would like to finish uh, by this observation. The present crisis revealed that the European security system has its flaws. And it is not only about finding room for considering Russia's legitimate security needs. It is also about the honest reading and perception of Putin's ambitions and his deployment of all possible means, including economic, media, and energy resources as weaponry. 
We need innovation and modernization of key concepts of strategic security in Europe that would include both Ukraine and post-Putin non-imperial Russia. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Taraj. Thank you, Professor Dobko, for this analysis. We have already three questions in the chat, which is a very good sign. So we'll come back to that after our panel. Our second panelist, Professor O'Connell, please. Mary Ellen, if I may call on you, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Taras, for that really wonderful opening to this discussion. As you indicated, this crisis, the Russia-Ukraine crisis, is really being waged over bedrock principles of international law and order in the world. That's the way one former US official is already phrasing it. Let me discuss three legal concepts at the heart of the conflict. First, the rights of sovereign states, in particular, Ukraine's right to territorial integrity and political independence. Second, the sanctity of treaties, including Russia's right to have binding promises honored. Third, the concept that international relations are based on common rules and principles and institutions, what the United States likes to call the rules-based system. I'll say a few words about each of them, how they're under pressure now and why they matter. And I hope we'll have more discussion in the Q&A of any particular points people want drawn out. Ukraine became a fully sovereign state, as Tarish already pointed out, under an agreement with Russia in 1991. The international borders that Ukraine had at that time remain its borders under international law unless and until Ukraine would give its own authentic consent to changes. Sovereign states have also have the right to be free of interference from outside with their political affairs. They may choose their own leaders. They may choose their own system of economics. They may not suffer political interference. That's the concept of political independence. These sovereign prerogatives, territorial integrity, political independence, sovereignty, are guaranteed in the United Nations Charter, especially Article 2, Paragraph 4, that prohibits the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. These are critical rules, not just for Ukraine, not just for the US, they're critical for Russia. So why is Russia challenging Ukraine on, uh, and, 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 and perhaps violating these very principles? We heard Tarash explain Putin's personal ambitions for Russia. There are also, um, but there's also reason why Russia is concerned legitimately for its status and security in the world. And some of those concerns are related to broken promises. Let me cite just two to help fill out the picture of what we're discussing here today. First, with regard to Russia's status in the world, it believes that the 1990 promise made by the United States that NATO would not expand into the former a sphere of influence of the Soviet Union has been broken. That plainly undermined Russia's status to have NATO moving in on territory and in, in a geographic space that it considered vital to its security and cultural and other interests. In addition, and this is one we are not hearing much discussion of, but I think it's very important to this problem of Russia's status in the world. The United States and its Western allies have done a great deal to undermine the status of the United Nations, including the status, the privileged status of the five permanent members of the Security Council. And that of course includes Russia. So NATO has expanded and the United States, let me give you some examples of how the US has undermined the Security Council and the promise of the charter that those five permanent members would have this privileged status in the world. The Security Council is the party that can give authorization for the use of force in situations that don't fall under um, arm, uh, self defense to an armed attack or the consent of a sovereign state. The United States in 1999 just blew past that prohibition, that requirement of a Security Council authorization in attacking Serbia together with its NATO allies, um, Serbia, an ally of Russia in the Kosovo crisis. The United States did so again in 2003 
in invading Iraq together with Britain and Australia when it was absolutely clear that the Security Council had to authorize any use of force in that situation of alleged arms control. Third, in 2011, the United States and NATO used force excessively beyond the Security Council mandate in Libya. I could name other instances. The US has acted in disregard of the rules and system and the system, the very system that it now demands Russia obey. If, however, Russia were to in, in, invade, despite perhaps uh, clear grievances, that invasion, a full invasion to take over Ukraine, will be a blow to the international system from which it may not recover. It's on the order of magnitude of when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, an act of aggression in clear violation of the United Nations Charter and other principles. The world came together in 1990 unanimously, including the Soviet Union, to end that use of force against Kuwait, to liberate Kuwait, and it did so successfully. It will be imperative if we're going to retain the system, this rules-based order based on the prohibition of the use of force for the world to act effectively against any uh, attempt to fully invade um, Ukraine. And it needs, the world needs to act effectively against lesser provocations as well, an attempt at regime change or to take just pieces of Ukraine. But, and I ha can't emphasize this too much, any measures taken to respond to fundamental violations of international law against Ukraine by Russia, those responses themselves must follow the rules. If we're gonna rebuild, if we're gonna save the world's rules-based order, then the way, the means of preserving the rules have to themselves be lawful. For example, there's been discussion recently about taking preemptive military action against Russia to stop any potential invasion. Well, that's a violation of the UN Charter. It would be trying to defend the law and rights of Ukraine by violating the law. It would only end up undermining the system we're trying to preserve. Further, uh, we've, we've been discussing uh, the need for sanctions. Well, sanctions must follow rules as well. There are rules that make the use of economic sanctions lawful or unlawful in responding to a prior violation of international law. In order to have the most effective sanctions, which in my view are cutting oil and gas purchases, which will be very painful for the Europeans, but it was a fatal mistake not to cut those purchases in 2014 when Crimea was invaded. To, to be clear that that would be a lawful move, in my view, requires a UN General Assembly resolution. The General Assembly should be in session right now under the acting under the Uniting for Peace resolution. And it's, it's a real failure of the Biden administration that they have not called that meeting and gotten the international community coalescing in support of Ukraine against Russia. There's talk instead about cyber attacks. Well, there are rules about cyber attacks and they're really, really very difficult to use lawfully in order to have a positive outcome in a crisis like this. Finally, there's the organization of security and cooperation in Europe. This needs to be the focus for a long-term successful resolution of this problem, for the bargain for exchange that is at the heart of any successful negotiation. The organization did pretty well in coming up with um, Minsk II, an agreement that created some uh, idea of a ceasefire and, and perhaps prevented worse uh, uses of force on, in the east of Ukraine. But that agreement needs fundamental uh, rewriting with much stronger uh, principles for human rights protection, for demilitarization. It needs to involve the United States and it needs to have clear sanctions if it's violated. All these things can happen. This is the way we should go forward. International law requires a peaceful settlement of this dispute. The co-pillar is principal Article 2.3 of the UN Charter together with Article 2.4. That's how we rebuild the world. We rebuild security and protection both for Ukraine and for its neighbor, Russia. And we begin to tackle the, the, the problems that really need our attention, climate change, human rights, global health. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Mary Ellen, Professor O'Connell. 
for this uh, analysis of um, territorial sovereignty, sanctity of treatises, and uh, the common rules, and the reminder that any response needs to follow rules. We move now to political science security studies perspective. Professor Desch, Mike, if I may ask you to take the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks very much, Clemens. Great to be here. Great topic and uh, great to be with Mary Ellen and Tarish. I want to talk about three things over the next 10 minutes. I want to give you a slightly different account of the origins of the crisis. I want to tell you what I would do to end the crisis. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, I'm not dictator of the world. Uh, so I also got to tell you what I think the US government and the international community will do. Uh, just to sort of tip my hat, my bottom line is a bad news, good news story. The bad news is I don't think the United States and the international community will do the right things. And I'll say a little bit more about that. On the other hand, I don't think that this crisis is going to end with a bang. Uh, it'll end, if it does end, uh, with a whimper. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So let me talk just briefly about the origins. Uh, Tarish's remarks, uh, I think, are typical of sort of the conventional view of the crisis, which begins in uh, 2014 with the Russian annexation of Crimea and the Donbass uh, rebellion. Uh, although some people would go back to the 2008 uh, war between Russia and Georgia. In both cases, uh, the uh, implication is that Russia uh, is the troublemaker. Uh, I draw a little bit different timeline. Uh, the current U Ukraine crisis, in my view, is uh, in part, in large part, the result of two bad decisions the United States and NATO took in the 1990s. The first, and here I'm going to, uh, in uncharacteristic agreement with Mary Ellen, uh, echo her um, on the expansion of NATO. The historical record is very clear um, that uh, the United States gave uh, the Soviet Union uh, verbal assurances that we would not expand NATO. And I spent a lot of time in Russia in the 90s uh, during the Yeltsin administration. Um, and a lot of Russian governments, uh, or uh, a lot of Russian Democrats and uh, Yeltsin government officials were telling us that the stakes of NATO expansion uh, included uh, Russian democracy. And in fact, I was in a meeting with the Russian uh, foreign minister, uh, Andrei Kozarev, uh, where he made that uh, argument uh, quite clearly. Now, as they used to say in the old Soviet Union, it's no accident, comrade, that the first tranche of NATO expansion uh, in 1999 was soon followed uh, by the coming to power uh, of Vladimir Putin, uh, first as an interim uh, and then as uh, the permanent uh, uh, prime minister um, in uh, 2000. Now, 2008 is important, but not for the reasons that many people think. It was 2008 at Bucharest, uh, where largely um, at the urging of the United States and the Bush administration, NATO formally opened the door uh, to membership uh, by Georgia and Ukraine, not Eastern European countries, um, but um, uh, uh, former uh, integral parts uh, of the Soviet Union. So that's mistake one, number one. Mistake number two was our well-intentioned, but ultimately, uh, I think, counterproductive effort in the 90s through the Nunn-Luger Act to denuclearize Ukraine, Belarus, um, and Kazakhstan. Um, and the arguments, I think, you know, were reasonable about uh, why we would want them to denuclearize. But in terms of the geopolitical situation, situation that those countries were in and the likelihood that they would feel, um, you know, pressed living so close to uh, Russia, um, that was uh, clearly uh, going to be a downside of uh, the Nunn-Luger process. So 
what should we do um, to end the crisis? It seems to me, despite what Tarish said uh, about neutralization, that it is in fact precisely the neutralization of Ukraine and Georgia uh, that is uh, the off-ramp uh, for this uh, crisis. Now, if Ukraine still had a nuclear deterrent, I don't even think we'd be holding this uh, flash panel today because uh, it would have the ultimate uh, guarantee of its security. Um, but still, even without a nuclear deterrent, uh, Ukrainian uh, neutrality uh, will defuse this crisis and also uh, be a way to reconcile the reality uh, of Ukraine's geopolitical position and its weakness vis-a-vis -vis Russia with the principles of sovereignty. Um, and Finland, Austria, and even Yugoslavia uh, maintained uh, a pretty good standard of living and for the most part, uh, a fair amount of sovereignty uh, during the Cold War. Second thing that we need to do is reassess relations with Russia. In 1815, at the Concert of Europe, Metternich and Castlereagh sought to reintegrate post-Napoleonic France into the European order. Um, and that was the right thing to do. With the end of the Cold War, the United States um, and some of the uh, NATO allies took exactly the opposite approach to dealing uh, with Russia. Uh, to give them, uh, in effect, the booby prize while uh, taking advantage uh, of the outcome of the Cold War and the breakup of the Soviet Union. And this was bad in terms of uh, you know, relations with Russia because Russia was always likely to recover somewhat from the collapse of the Soviet Union. But it's even dumber in the geopolitical context in which the United States regards China as its main great power peer competitor in the 21st century. Uh, and here we are uh, in a peripheral fight with Russia uh, over uh, a secondary interest in terms of uh, American interest when we should be doing everything we can to divide uh, Putin and Xi, who, by the way, are not natural allies. So that's what we should do. <clears throat> I don't think we're going to do it. Um, what will we do? Well, the reason we won't do the right thing, I think, comes down to uh, four things. First of all, we continue to see NATO expansion as a success. That was the language of the Bucharest summit. Um, and I think I've made very clear that it was not a success in terms of uh, US-Russian relations, NATO-Russian relations, or even democracy uh, in Russia. Secondly, it papers over deep divisions, even among the, Europe, the NATO uh, members, uh, about how to deal with Russia. Germany is sort of the poster child for this, but there is a lot of uncertainty uh, that tilts in the German direction uh, um, among NATO allies. Second problem, and he, here I'll get to my characteristic arguing with Mary Ellen, but I think we're committed to an unrealistic notion of sovereignty. Sovereignty is a juridical context, and as Mary Ellen knows, a juridical concept is fighting words for me. In practice, this juridical concept needs to be tempered by the realities uh, of power and interest. So yes, uh, Ukraine uh, will have to sacrifice some of its juridical sovereignty in much the same way that Cuba or Mexico uh, or even Canada uh, sacrifice it. Thirdly, we hate Putin in the West, um, and to be sure, he deserves it. He, he's a rotten guy. Um, but just because he's a rotten guy does not mean that he's wrong about everything uh, or that he doesn't speak for the majority of the Russian people who regard not only um, the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union um, and the expansion of NATO into post-Soviet space as a humiliation, but they also regard it as a pressing security threat. And in Russia, uh, people have a long historical memory for good reason. And the Second World War is never far uh, from Russia's historical um, 
conscience. Um, and there, the position of Ukraine uh, is at best ambivalent. Uh, and you can understand why the Russians would be wary about a Ukraine gravitating uh, towards the West. Um, finally, there's no doubt, as Terry says, that Ukraine is a democratizing country. But I don't think it follows that we necessarily owe it preferential treatment on those grounds. It's not a stable democracy yet. And in fact, it has some very illiberal, illiberal uh, elements to it. Um, and uh, you know, so let's not romanticize Ukrainian democracy. Even a very robust Ukrainian democracy though could still present a problem of the tyranny of a majority vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Russia speakers um, in Ukraine, which is why uh, you got uh, overwhelming support uh, among the Russian speakers for uh, seceding from the Union uh, in Crimea um, and why there's large support uh, in Donbass for that. So we've got to follow our interests, uh, not just uh, think about uh, principles here. Uh, and I think we can balance both. Now, we are at time, Mike, as you know. Yep. And uh, so just very quickly, I don't believe that President Putin is ultimately going to uh, invade Ukraine. Uh, I think that he's keeping the uh, pot boiling in order to, uh, to get concessions. And it seems to me uh, one concession uh, that we could make uh, would be to say that uh, Ukraine will not get NATO membership. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Desch. Thank you, Mike. Dear panelists, it would be so tempting now to have an, a discussion among the panelists since there were some, some fruitful tensions already. But we already have 11 questions in the Q&A. Dear audience, we have a little less than 20 minutes uh, for questions. So I think I will turn to the questions right away, if I may. And I will ask our dear panelists to be as brief and precise in your responses as you can possibly be. Uh, if I may start, and I have to select um, if we may start with two questions, putting them together. Um, Reynaldo Hernandez, if, as, I've often, as I have often heard, Eastern Ukraine is more Russian and Ukrainian in culture, and there's active homegrown resistance to the Kiev government, why not seek a negotiated agreement with moving the border westward with a transition period to allow Ukrainian leaning and Russian leaning people to choose which side of the border they prefer with government assisted relocation? And connected to this question, Fritz Heinzen, uh, Professor Dotko, would you please give us your estimate of what percentage of Ukrainians want to stand up to Russia, what percentage want to accommodate Russia, and what percentage sits on the fence? So maybe Taras would start with you. What's your response to those two questions? Yeah, thank you for uh, these very important questions. So we'll start from the second one. Uh, because I do have the statistics, there are surveys about it, of course, and uh, more than half of Ukrainians would uh, would resist in some way if uh, the Russia tries to invade. A third, one third of Ukrainians would resist uh, with arms in their hands. So I think this is quite quite high uh, quite high percentage. Another thing about you know Russian speaking population, there are so many myths about it. Let me give you just a few facts. So the present the present president. Volodymyr Zelensky uh, was elected mostly by uh, people from Eastern Ukraine, from these territories, who is uh, uh, a Russian speaking, so whose dominant language is Russian. Of course, when he is officially speaks as president, uh, he uses Ukrainian, uh, who is of uh, Jewish origin himself. Uh, there are, uh, the problem is that, you know, uh, Russia considers Russian speaking population, which is actually one third of the country, uh, considers them as part of its political nation. But Ukraine is a political nation. Ukraine is not an, eth an ethnic nation, uh, so, so in state. And uh, Russian speaking population uh, are such citizens as Ukrainian speaking population as, as well. And, uh, you know, the, we, we have to uh, take also into account that. Uh, Russian language is much more used, for example, in, in media than Ukrainian. So the, this fact uh, somehow caused, you know, the parliament 
to introduce even some quotas so that uh, media outlets use Ukrainian language and it is not lost as a language of communication in uh, in our country. Uh, so okay. there Thank is no yeah. there is no discrimination against uh, Russian speakers in Ukraine. Thank you, Tarash. The questions are exploding. So please may I take the liberty of the chairperson here just to assign questions to our esteemed panelists. Mary Ellen, there's a question from Ashley Lizana. I understand that, um, hey, you have moved the question now. I understand that the US broke the same rules in which they are holding Russia to, but is it possible that it would not matter if the US did follow the rules-based system because Russia likely would break those rules anyway? It never, it's, it's never a, an acceptable argument to me to say, because somebody has committed murder, I'm free to commit murder too. We are trying to establish, the United States clearly is trying to establish a system in which peace prevails, people have a chance to earn a living, prosper in a healthy uh, environment. And we won't get to any of those things if because there are law violators in the world, we violate the law. And that's why, in, in contrast to what Mike said, it is so significantly important to the United States to counter Russian aggression against Ukraine. It's for the same reasons that we countered Iraqi aggression against Kuwait. In Mike's world, what is Kuwait to the United States? Who cares? Why would we spend all the money and risk all the lives? Because we want to have a system in which trade is possible, in which human rights are respected. These are American values that we've helped promote through the UN. And the fact that after the Cold War ended, we began to let down those values because we became arrogant and thought we could run the world the way we wanted is coming home to roost in this crisis right now. So I, I couldn't disagree with Mike more. It's, it's extremely important for the United States to lead a worldwide coalition in responding to aggression. And the way that it can, I, I'm not disagreeing with, you know, there, there's scope in what Mike said to reach a peaceful settlement that will be, the only way you reach settlement is that everyone gets something out of it for the sacrifices they made. And there are things that, that Russia could, uh, that it wants, that it could uh, trade, for example, in the arms control field, um, in, in, in guarantees of no further NATO expansion. Mike and I do agree on that, but let's not forget that Russia is currently in serious violation of international law by being in occupation of Crimea and, what, and parts of the Donbass and what Ukraine is entitled to in terms of any settlement, in terms of anything that it might do in uh, demilitarized zones or autonomy zones or giving up uh, membership in NATO is to get its country back. Russia has to finally agree and the world needs to insist on because that's the bedrock of all the other principles that we need. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ann. A, a question for Mike, and obviously, Mike, you can <laughs> put something else into the answer. Um, um, Professor Dash mentioned the Russia-Georgia war. What do you think if the democratic world had reacted more strongly in 2008 when Russia invaded Georgia and occupied 20% of its territories, the world would face this problem today? Well, it, again, the uh, question here is, did Russia out of the blue invade Georgia uh, or was this uh, the result uh, of uh, increasing uh, pro-NATO sentiment in Georgia and the opening of the door to Georgian uh, and Ukrainian membership um, in uh, uh, 2008 at the uh, Bucharest uh, NATO summit? Um, and so I think, you know, to sort of start history in 2008 and 2014 and ignore everything before it, it's easy to caricature Russia as the uh, aggressor. Um, but I think a fair reading of history uh, would in fact uh, point out that uh, there's plenty of responsibility on both sides. If I could just very quickly respond to Mary Ellen and uh, territorial sovereignty, 
Uh, just go back and uh, look at the historical borders, the evolution uh, of the borders, uh, both within the Soviet Union uh, and uh, in Eastern Europe after the end of the Second World War. Uh, there's been a lot of border changes over time. And again, to say that the annexation of uh, Crimea in 2014 uh, is the original sin in all this ignores a lot of earlier original sins. So look at the uh, beam in your own eye instead of the moat uh, 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 in uh, Russia's. <laughs> I mean, Mary Ellen, you can't have two sentences. Thanks, thank respond. you. First, I think I was plenty critical of the United States. So I think I saw, I'm aware of the moat in my own eye. But second, we know that the rules-based order is based on the 1945 UN Charter. The borders that we're interested in and the principles of border law are from 1945 forward. Ukraine got- And the, oh, and the change in Crimea was post-1945. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, any boundary change is permissible with the full sovereign consent of a state giving it. And that's what happened to Crimea. It, with the consent of the Soviet Union, it was added to the to Ukraine. Thank you. Let, let may, us may, just one, to the... may just one sentence. So I, I wonder how yes, far back Michael would like to go, you know, considering the question of orders. If you talk about Crimea, so the really uh, the original population there are Crimean Tatars. Let's remember about them. And they were actually uh, occupied by the Russian Empire in the you know, 18th century. I mean, Tarash, there's even a, a comment or a question by Professor Selman. How relevant are all the historical cases in thinking about this crisis? The Sudetenland in the late 1930s, for example. So, but I would like to move to Germany. We have two questions uh, related to the role of Germany. So, so uh, one question is, why should Germany's hesitancy to support Ukraine be considered a deep division in NATO if it is committed to finishing Nord Stream 2? And the other question, how should Germany's ambivalence toward the crisis factor into the US and NATO's decision making process uh, for finding a resolution uh, to the potential conflict? Let's start with Mike this time. Okay, well, it, it's not just Nord Stream 2, although that's been a big issue, but you know, there was a uh, German um, admiral who was uh, forced out last week uh, for suggesting uh, yep. a, a much more balanced view of who's right uh, and who's wrong in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And so I think that uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg uh, of uh, differences in opinion uh, in Europe among NATO allies about what's at stake here and what we should do about it. And it's pretty fundamental. Right. Taras, any comment on Germany? So I think, you know, as always from the uh, situation, which is not, you know, the best, we should take uh, what could be used, you know, for the best. And I think that for me, it's interesting to see if Germany could become a negotiator, you know, who would be, uh, per, uh, who would be persuasive for uh, the Russians. And uh, so this is one positive outcome that could yeah. come out of this situation with Germany. Thank yeah, you. Could I, if I could just say very briefly about Germany um, to concur with Tarash, because remember, it was France and Germany that played the uh, modern mediator role between Russia and Ukraine in reaching the ceasefire agreements that have been reached. Yeah. So I think Germany's trying to maintain that role, but it's gone too far. And the, and the, and the Minsk agreements, the earlier agreements have not succeeded. So I'm sorry that Germany is it's, it's in a delicate political moment itself with this coalition government, but it has to see that its failure to cut off gas purchases in 2014, in the moment, and it, everyone who knows about sanctions and how they can be effective know that they have to work in, very strongly in the critical moment. Germany didn't act when it should have, and now it's going to have to, and, and it's very politically difficult with the cost that it would yeah. come to Germany and the suffering to Germany to cut, but it's either that or there is going to be a very bloody situation yeah. in Ukraine. Can we can we stay at the level of sanctions? Another question for Mary Ellen. The Biden administration has threatened to introduce new sanctions that go much further than 2014 sanctions. 
one question, how should we think about the imposition of new sanctions in an international law context? Second, should we expect sanctions to be an effective deterrent against Russian aggression? Building on what I just said, yeah. I think all the sanctions that the Biden administration has so far talked about, including the latest um, export controls on microchips and, and high tech electronics will not work. The, the, it's well known in the area of, of sanctions that it's got to be a very tough uh, price for Russia to pay um, to do something as, 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 as hard as it would be if, if Putin makes the decision to cross a boundary line, even just to take some, it's got to be tough enough to be the substitute for a counter military action by the West. And I, the, in, in my analysis, that's only oil and gas. So I, I'm not impressed by what the Biden administration has done, but let me underscore, these sanctions have to be lawful. And I, it, it, they, I, I'm expecting in the next day or two for the Biden administration to finally get its act together and get the UN General Assembly in, a, in an emergency session to talk about exactly this point. Thank um, you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. A question to maybe Taras and then Mike. How are other former nations that were part of the former Soviet Union and are part of the NATO responding to the crisis? So our former uh, Soviet uh, member states responded to the crisis. Say, for example, the Baltic states. Is there fear that they will experience also a similar reaction from Russia as Ukraine is currently experiencing? Maybe Taras first and then Mike. Yeah, so uh, I know about, about Baltic states. Yeah, they are very supportive uh, of uh, the Ukraine of Ukraine and of uh, the Ukrainian response to uh, to the situation. Uh, so we know about Belarus, which is uh, a major, could become a major problem for Ukraine because I will remind that geographically, the access to Kyiv from Belarus is uh, much more easier. It's away, you know, 60 kilometers away, you know, from the Belarusian border. So, and now Russia moved some troops to, to Belarus. And you know that President Biden also warned uh, Belarus if it uh, joins, you know, Russia in its uh, aggression, so it will also have uh, consequences. So in this sense, so you see the, the reaction is mixed depending on the really security situation uh, in uh, uh, of each country, of course, you know there are countries that are united with Russia in this uh, in this agreement. Uh, I don't remember how to uh, tell it uh, in in English, and they are mostly silent about the situation. I mean, Armenia, for example, and Kazakhstan. It's its own problems as well. Yeah. Thank you, Taros. Mike, is it okay if I give you another question? Just yeah, sure. Just looking at the time and honoring our audience. Yeah, um, of course. From, from Kate McLaughlin. Professor Dopko stated that the current buildup of Russian troops may result in either, one, a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, or two, locally targeted operations that attempt to destabilize the country and induce panic in the population. Question, would military invasion option one or operations that induce panic among Ukrainians, option two, more effectively advance Russia's political objective to fracture NATO and weak the European security system? Well, I think one of the reasons that uh, uh, Russia is unlikely to uh, actually invade uh, the Ukraine is that uh, doing so uh, would in fact uh, galvanize NATO, um, you know, and so uh, it would be uh, counterproductive. I think also that uh, Putin realizes that uh, outside of Crimea and Donbas, the majority of the Ukrainian population uh, supports Kiev to a greater or lesser extent. Um, and, you know, even the so-called uh, coup option of, uh, you know, reinstalling a pro-Russian government uh, is unlikely to be successful. Yanukovych was overthrown in 2014, um, and there isn't anybody more attractive that, that you could put in. I think Russia is doing uh, what it can in terms of you know, rattling the saber by uh, moving troops close to the border, holding exercises, um, engaging in cyber attacks, um, but that's likely to be as uh, as far as uh, as they go. Okay. Um, and the key thing, this is coercive bargaining. Uh, it's part and parcel of it. 
Yeah, we have we have two questions that would basically talk directly to the invasion that Professor Desch doesn't think is, is very likely to happen. And these questions are, does Ukraine believe it would survive a Russian invasion? Assuming the Russian armed forces invade, how do you assess Ukraine's ability to sustain a protracted insurgency? Tarash, would you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I will share some things. You know, first, I think the most likely scenario would is that uh, if Russia invades, they will try to destroy uh, Ukraine's military forces. And in this sense, symbolically to show that, you know, what was invested in Ukrainian defense by uh, the USA and by, by other uh, NATO, NATO states was, was in vain. So this, I think, is, is, very, is very possible. Another possibility is, to, you know, to, to have a blitzkrieg and move really to Kyiv. And just you know to very quickly to seize uh, Kiev, uh, but in terms of the whole you know uh, whole occupation of Ukraine, I think this is just impossible, and uh, Putin understands it. You know when you take you know Western Ukraine, unless you so you, you Putin just doesn't have such military you know forces. Uh, they could suppress you know the because they are much stronger uh, the the army but they will not be able to suppress the resistance of the people. So because Thank it you. will be national war. Thank you, Tarash. Uh, we have, let's say three minutes left and I would like to give each panelist one minute for a final statement. And uh, Mike, you always have so much to say. Would you like to start with your <laughs> one minute final statement? Maximum one minute. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, in many respects, uh, the Ukraine-Russia crisis is a sideshow to, uh, you know, the most important geopolitical issues of the 21st century, which is not in, by any means to uh, ignore uh, the costs on uh, especially the people of Ukraine of being uh, a flashpoint. But I think it's also important to put it in the context of uh, America's larger geopolitical interests. And when you do that, settling this uh, is the best option and neutrality is the key to that settlement. Thank you, Professor Desch. Mary Ellen, we will give the last word to our visitor. So Mary Ellen, please. Yes. Ukraine-Russia crisis is not a sideshow. It's not a sideshow, of course, for the people directly involved, but not for the people of the world either. We are looking at similar tests of the world order. For example, China and Taiwan. If the United States doesn't want to become a secondary power in which these rising powers act with this kind of aggression um, and throw out the rules and dictate how the US and others are supposed to live, we need to respond to this very clear provocation now. And with the hope that we can start to work on the problems that really are the existential crises points for the United States. Number one on my list, climate change. Number two, human rights atrocities growing out of the armed conflicts that continue around the world, Ethiopia, Sudan, so many other places. Thank you. That's the way we have to go. Thank you, Mary Ellen. And again, I regret that we cannot have an internal discussion. Tarash, uh, one minute as a final yeah. statement. Thank you for being with yeah, us. So, uh, thank you, uh, Clemens. Uh, you know, Ukraine's mistake was that, you know, after 1991, we perceived weakened Russia as a new normal, and that we believed that the era of empires you know was over so we lost much time and opportunity to get prepared for the present uh, response but as you saw in my speech i tried to speak about more about putin or putin's russia and not so much about russia so i hope that at some point there will be possibility to coexist peacefully Thank you so much. Dear colleagues and friends, uh, we are at time. I want to thank all our panelists for their really insightful, provocative, and thought-stimulating contributions. I want to thank our audience. We had close to 200 people I, I saw here. Uh, for your questions, I apologize that we couldn't answer all of those, or deal with all of those, but thank you so much for your interest. Um, I would like to thank our tech people and our communication people who made this virtual event possible, um, especially Grant Osborne, Becca Prince, and Grania McEvoy. Thank you so much. 
at the very end, may I please remind you that the Nanovic Institute will host another virtual lecture on Tuesday, February 8 at noon. It will be the Laura Shannon Prize Award Lecture with British historian Peter Gadrell. He will talk about migration and uh, will have a lot to say about uh, another uh, big challenge for Europe. Stay tuned. Thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of the afternoon and let's hope for the best. One person said, Mike, I pray that Professor Dash is right. So let's pray that Professor Dash is right, that there will not be an invasion. No Thank need you. to pray, <laughs> just believe. <laughs>